Welcome to the Miami Herbert Business School. I'm Ann Olazabal, the interim dean here at the school. And it is my great pleasure to open up this event tonight. Um, you know, the school doesn't run on tuition alone. I don't know if that comes as a, as a surprise to some of you sitting in this room, but it doesn't. And one of the things that sustain, sustains the school over time is philanthropic gifts. And this is an example of the type of enrichment that we can offer to our community, not just students, but alumni and local uh, uh, community members uh, and other guests by way of philanthropy. So last year, the Henry family made an endowed gift that allows us to have this type of endowed economics lecture every year in perpetuity. That's what that means when we have an endowment. So I'm just really thrilled to be here to welcome you to the second annual Henry Family Endowed Lecture in Economics. And I'm not going to uh, introduce our speaker. Instead, I'm gonna turn that job over to the department chair of our Department of Economics, David Andalfato, <laughs> who I will allow to give his own mini introduction of himself before he introduces the speaker. Thank you so much for coming and after um, the event, please join us outside for a short reception. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I wasn't, I forgot that I was to introduce myself. My name is David Andalfato. I'm chair of the economics department. Um, Long-time academic in the Canadian university system, and I moved to the St. Louis Fed, in fact, in 2009, where Jim was actually my boss. So. Uh, that's my, my connection with Jim. And thank you, Anne, for that introduction. And, and like I said, good evening. It's, great, it's great, uh, a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce our speaker, uh, Jim Bullard, presently dean, uh, dean of the uh, Daniel School of Business at Purdue University. But of course, as many of you know, prior to becoming dean, Jim, Jim was president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, probably fewer of you can recall uh, the date on which he was appointed to that office. So does anybody have an idea? Anyone? Simon? No, close. But the date, the exact date. April the 1st, 2008. April the 1st. So um, poor Jim had to wait a, a day before his uh, family and friends actually believed the announcement. But, uh, kind of, I guess that proves, if nothing else, the Fed does have a little bit of a sense of humor. But, but you know, that year turned out to be no joke, right? That fall, as many of you might recall, that fall was the, you know, uh, the, after the Lehman crisis, uh, the, you know, the global economy plunged into the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. So, I mean, if there was ever a trial by fire for an incoming president, I guess you experienced it, Jim. Uh, but, you know, uh, to be fair, uh, he wasn't a rookie. He wasn't a novice. He was... Jim had already spent close to 20 years at the, at the St. Louis Fed, leading the uh, you know parts of the research division and also uh, undertaking a number of different activities. Plus, he's a great, great scholar and researcher in his own right in, in the profession. And I think that um, I think it was that background, that background that he had, the experience, uh, you know, the practical uh, policy advice working in the Fed, together with his academic credentials that really propelled him throughout his career as Fed president as being one of the uh, you know, leading uh, and most influential members of the FOMC for the, for the next 15 years. Um, and just to give you uh, some sense of his prescience, uh, there's many, many such examples we could talk about later, but just to give you some sense, I recall in March of 2021, he published an article that came out in the Regional Economist of the St. Louis Fed, and, and the title of the article was, Is Inflation on the horizon for the US economy. You know, kind of suggesting that he's a bit worried. Uh, now keep in mind, I mean, this he wrote this probably in March, I guess, possibly before, at a time when inflation was averaging something like 100 basis points below the Fed's 2% inflation target since the beginning of the pandemic. Inflation actually fell uh, over that period. So, I mean, it wasn't so obvious. <laughs> and of course, we had the experience of low inflation for the previous 10 years or so. And yet, Jim, in his true academic, this is why I think having academics uh, in the FOMC is such a, a, a compliment 
to the committee. You don't want them all to be academics, but having some is a great strength because Jim drew on his knowledge of economic theory. And he wrote this article. And in this article, he pointed to three leading theories of inflation. It's kind of like three different religions, uh, different, different ways of thinking about inflationary forces. And each one of these three theories was pointing in the same direction, which is what he pointed out. And he said, he's, he sounded a, a kind of an early alarm saying, you know, I, I don't know, but uh, we haven't had inflation. Inflation seems low, but you know, <laughs> My, my, this body of theory that I'm familiar with is, seems, is, is suggesting that we might be in for a year of higher, uh, the higher inflation. And um, almost on cue, I mean, that March 2021 inflation broke 2%. And it came in at 2.7%. And then in April, it came in at 3.7%. And then it kept on going up. And it, it eventually peaked uh, in the summer of 2022. So good call. <laughs> <laughs> Very good call. Now, of course, uh, the Fed's policy rate uh, since the start of the pandemic was basically set to zero, uh, close to zero, and the Fed only started raising rates aggressively early in 2022. Uh, headline inflation has since declined. Uh, it's presently around 2.4% January, February this year, so well off its, high, its peak of the summer of 2022. Uh, to the surprise of many, uh, tighter monetary policy and the sharp disinflation that followed occurred without a recession. Um, and so Jim's talk tonight asks a question that I think is on many people's minds. Can the Fed stick the soft landing? So in other words, can the Fed steer inflation back for good or for, you know, uh, anchor it to 2% without causing a recession? Jim, I mean, we're all looking forward to the answer tonight. And so let's all please welcome Jim Buller. Well, thanks very much. And thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, we've got uh, really a great audience here. I'm looking forward to a Q&A um, uh, after I finish the main part of my talk here. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here in, at University of Miami, last year's Final Four participant. <laughs> this year, uh, Purdue is going to be the Final Four uh, participant in place of <laughs> University of Miami. So we'll see how we can do out in Phoenix here. We're very excited about that possibility. So um, yeah, so this is about all about current monetary policy, and I know some people here uh, follow this uh, very closely. Others uh, maybe not as familiar, but don't worry. Uh, I'll, this is kind of a techie talk, uh, but I'll walk you through um, what I have in mind here so that it has a shocking conclusion. So we'll see if you can stay awake long enough to figure out what the shocking conclusion is. Um, let me thank uh, Wei Zhang uh, for research assistance in uh, putting this talk together. Um, so what this is, is this is an updated version of a talk that I gave in November of 2022. Um, so some of the material is actually the same out of that talk, but the conclusions uh, go in a different direction uh, this time. So that talk got a lot of attention, so we'll see what uh, people think about this one. So. Um, Basically, what happened, as David outlined here uh, in the preliminaries, uh, if you weren't paying attention, uh, uh, inflation went way up in 2021. And this was after years and years of not having any inflation in the US. So I think for many of you in this room, that was your first experience with uh, going to the store and being shocked uh, at how much things cost and uh, dismayed, uh, uh, probably. Um, so. What happened was that uh, the inflation is the Federal Reserve's policy, and uh, uh, so the Federal Reserve had to take action uh, to get inflation to come back down. And the usual action that the Federal Reserve takes is to raise uh, the policy rate, short-term interest rate, um, quite a bit. And we did that in 2022 and into 2023, and um, that was intended to return inflation to the 2% target. Um, we also did some balance sheet policy, which we can get into in the Q&A if people want to talk about that, but I'm not going to talk about it in this talk. And um, <clears throat> lo and behold, uh, we applied the medicine and the medicine worked. Inflation had gone way up, but then inflation started to come down during 
2023, and especially the second half of 2023. So this is last year, uh, last six months of last year. So in global financial markets, this was a huge event, huge event. And uh, this, these are much bigger movements, uh, kind of a tidal wave compared to what we're used to in macroeconomics over the last 20 or 30 years. So uh, inflation came down in the last nine months or so by 200 basis points. That's a basis point is one one hundredth of a percentage point. So two percentage points, um, shocking amount. So um, now that inflation has come down, where should we set the policy rate? That's kind of the day-to-day -day question in financial markets and in monetary policy. And I'm gonna talk about my views of this. Um, and I'm gonna talk about it from the perspective of uh, recommendations from certain types of monetary policy rules, which are often talked about in the macroeconomics literature, and some of you might have talked about them a little bit in some of your classes. So uh, these, the idea behind the rules is that you take some inputs from the data that you're seeing out there in the big world, and you stick them into your rule, and your rule spits out where your policy rate should be, and then that's what you do. Um, so I like the rule that I'm going to talk about uh, because it gave consistent advice about uh, where the peak policy rate should be, um, and we'll see a picture of that. And it also gave good advice about uh, what the policy rate should be before the pandemic. Before the pandemic, low those many years ago, uh, it was pretty good economy in 2017, 2018, 2019 even coming into 2020, then you got hit by the pandemic in March of 2020. So that was a pretty good economy going on there. We had a pretty good interest rate policy at that point. You want your policy rule to be consistent with that. But the main point of this talk is that, okay, we do all this calculation here and the current value of the policy rate looks too high. In the pictures I show, it looks too high. So the basic message is that the um, policy rate has to be lowered. Uh, and that the FOMC has to get going on lowering the policy rate. So in the world of uh, financial markets, uh, this is a big thing because you're trying to value all these assets out there. You need to know what the discount factor is on all those assets. Um, I'll look at some alternative assumptions and some of the things that are being said in financial markets on the later slides. None of that's gonna change the main conclusion. So you already have the main conclusion, so you can go home, I guess. <laughs> Uh, but I'll show you some cool pictures and some cool, uh, here's a cool picture. Let me introduce it here a little bit. So um, the main picture will be on the next slide here. Um, there's a lot of information in this slide. So I'm going to show you the picture, then I'm going to unpack it, then I'm going to show you the picture again. Um, the, the, the idea behind this monetary policy rule is going to be that uh, the policy rate was just about right only nine months ago. But the problem is that a lot has happened in the last nine months and the, the rule wants, to, wants the policy rate to be adjusted in response to things that are happening out there in the economy. This big decline in inflation is not something that we have normally seen, but now that we have seen it, you gotta react according to the, uh, according to the policy rule. Um, and it, uh, it also suggests that if we just take the policy rule, the recommendation from the policy rule right now, uh, policy rate is too high. Interest rates are too high. So what does that mean? Mortgage rates are too high. Uh, other types of loan rates are too high. They should be lower according to this rule. So here's the picture. <clears throat> and. Uh, you guys think this is boring, but this is stupendously interesting. So, um, so let me spend enormous amounts of time on it. So uh, here we are in 2019 on the left-hand side. Uh, here we are in, at the present in 2024 on the right-hand side. The pandemic is the gray area there. That was the period of recession, uh, very short. Uh, I'll put only decline for about two months and then turned around. Um, the green line is the actual policy rate. So that's the thing that monetary policy controls, very short-term interest rate that has influence on all the other interest rates that are out there in the economy. 
and all around the world. So that's why the green line is very important in financial markets. And then uh, we've got two dotted lines here. One is a, a, a policy, the lower dotted line there is the policy rate that's recommended by a policy rule that has some generous assumptions in it. So we're being nice and we're, it's gonna give kind of soft values for the policy rate, low values for the policy rate. The upper bound, uh, the upper line there, dotted line, uh, has less generous assumptions, kind of more hawkish in the, in the words of the, uh, the way monetary policy is talked about in the popular press. Um, and so the area between the two lines is kind of a zone. If you want to be a little softer, you might go with the lower line. If you want to be a little tougher, you might go with the uh, higher line. But you should probably be somewhere between the two lines. That's the spirit of this uh, spirit of this talk. So um, let's look at this a just a little bit here. Um, uh, here we've got the pre-pandemic policy. Here's the pandemic, looking pretty good. Uh, they were right in the middle of the zone. If you remember 2019, which I'm sure you all do, just like the back of your hand. Uh, the policy rate was lowered here uh, because of trade wars at the, at the time that were going on, skirmishes with China and so on. So, uh, and there's pretty low number here below 2%. So anyway, this is all looking pretty good. Then you have the huge shock, the huge pandemic, and the policy rules say absolutely lower the policy rate all the way to zero, which is what happened. Uh, you had the policy rate all the way at zero. But wait a minute, you got into 2021 as David was describing, and uh, inflation started to go up all of a sudden, and the policy rules woke up, and they said uh, they both said you should have taken off, uh, raised the policy rate off the zero uh, in the middle of 2021. That didn't happen. Uh, the actual policy rate stayed uh, stayed low here, uh, stayed at zero into 2022, and this is the first interest rate increase. That was March of 2022, and people said. Oh gosh, you guys are way behind the curve. So I used this picture to say exactly what was said in financial markets, which was, you guys are way too late, you're behind the curve, you're not doing enough to control inflation, you're not doing your job, you're asleep at the wheel, all this kind of stuff. And what does that mean? That means this green line is below, out of the zone here. But to the credit of uh, Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve and the committee, uh, uh, this is a very steep line here. Um, the policy rate was raised 75 basis points per meeting for four meetings in a row. That would have been previously considered impossible, but it did happen and uh, without incident because we didn't get a, a recession out of that. And lo and behold, by the time you got into 2023 here, uh, at this point, you're in, the, you're in this zone, so you could say policy looks sufficiently restrictive. You're doing your job. You're, you're not asleep at the wheel anymore. You're getting inflation to come down. And then the point of this talk is to say, well, wait a minute now. <laughs> we got over here, but this, these things continued to move down because inflation moved down, uh, but the policy rate is still up here as we sit here tonight talking about it. It's, it's up here at five and three eighths. The rules are saying three to four percent would be uh, would be something pretty good, so it's kind of the reverse of where we were over here. Here you're you're too low for for where you should be. You finally get into the right zone here. Here you're too high today for where you should be. So what are the risks of that? The risks of that are uh, inflation goes below your target, below your two percent target, and you end up with too little inflation. Could be that you get a recession. Uh, and you disturb the labor market. So when you guys are trying to get a job, there aren't any jobs out there. Uh, so there are lots of risks to being too high. Um, so th this is a story I'm gonna tell. <clears throat> so uh, what I'm gonna do in the remainder of this talk is uh, unpack that chart, uh, talk about the ingredients into it, uh, give a little bit of uh, talk about monetary policy rules, um, and then I'll talk about some caveats and some issues that are being talked about in financial markets uh, when I get to the end. Okay, ready to go? Uh, so why monetary policy rules? Why do we care about this? Uh, John Taylor at Stanford University developed this whole line of literature starting in 1993, cited down here. Um, this Taylor rule or Taylor type rule uh, concept 
was brilliant because it, um, it integrated uh, ideas about where the policy rate should be with the rest of macroeconomics, uh, which I, before that hadn't really been integrated very well. Um, so uh, there's a whole literature around these kinds of rules. So uh, you know, people have studied uh, different uh, incarnations of models and shown that the rules can uh, give good recommendations. And uh, I'm gonna give these two types of assumptions, a, a more generous assumption and a less generous assumption. And we're gonna get this definition of a target uh, rule zone uh, between the lower and the upper bounds. <clears throat> so, um, I would say just one other thing about this, the literature takes legs of, lagged effects into account. So sometimes people say, well, you raise the interest rate today, but that doesn't have any impact until next year, or the peak impact is next year. That's coming, when people say that, they're parroting uh, Milton Friedman, uh, who said exactly that uh, 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, but Friedman was working with a different set of data a long time ago, and it's a whole different issue. So this literature has already been, has models that have the lags in there, and it's already saying, uh, here, you should use this policy rule for this model. So, um, so the lagged effects, uh, I would just like to stick that in there that I think that already takes us into account. And I like talking about policy rules when we're talking about interest rates uh, because it helps pin down the arguments. If you've got a way to talk about what's the right level of the policy rate instead of just making up things or bringing in this or that uh, feature that you might want to bring in. Here you've got a whole literature that says, no, they've looked at it, they've estimated this, here's the number. Okay, But there are lots of things that go into that, as we'll see. So what we're going to need is uh, several ingredients. One would be uh, a kind of hypothetical question that you could ask yourself. What would the value of the uh, short-term real interest rate be if uh, economic output was beautifully uh, being produced across the economy and if inflation was right at target, everything's beautiful, there aren't any shocks? What would the real interest rate be in that environment? And we're going to get different numbers for that. And we're going to stick that into our rule. And then we're going to have to ask uh, ourselves, how far is inflation from where we'd like it to be? So the FOMC has a target. It's 2% inflation. How far are you from that 2%? It's not that easy to answer because uh, different ways to measure inflation. But we'll talk about that. Um, and then a value uh, describing uh, the veracity of the central bank. How much do you want to react to that uh, inflation gap? Do you want to be soft and say, I'm not going to react all that much? Or do you want to be really tough and react uh, really strongly to uh, the deviation of inflation from target? And then finally, we'll need a value for the size of the, uh, the output gap as like, how much output are you producing in the economy versus the kind of normal level of output? <clears throat> That's going to take a back seat in this calculation. So here's some math for you, just to wake you up, because I know you're waiting for the math. Uh, but we're not going to talk too much about the math itself. Um, in fact, I'm going to skip this. <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to just talk about these ingredients that we need. So we need a short, safe, real rate of interest. This, has been, this is often called R star uh, in the literature. Uh, this has been studied uh, a lot, uh, especially in recent years. And um, the literature comes to a clear conclusion, which is <clears throat> the short-term real interest rate used to be really high in the 1980s, and it has been a, on a downward trend for 30 years or more since then, 35 years since then. So if you look at the pictures, uh, it's really clear. It seems to have come down. So now you've got these, what is in the 80s, you might have talked about numbers like 4 or 5% or, or 6%. Uh, these days, you talk about numbers like 0 or 1% or something like that. <clears throat> so the literature does seem to have uh, come to that conclusion. There's a lot of stories about that. Well, that's 
long-term effects, demographics, uh, other things, globalization, other things going on that have driven that real rate down over time. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this kind of thing. We just need to know where is it roughly today. So for the generous Taylor rule, uh, I'm gonna use a value of minus 50 basis points. That's minus one half of 1% because that's what I think it was before the pandemic. And if you think it was a higher number, uh, I'm gonna put a value of plus 50 basis points in the less generous uh, version of the Taylor rule. So we've got two values uh, for this. There's another value I'm gonna stick in here. My former colleague, uh, uh, John Williams, uh, president of the New York Fed, and his co-authors uh, uh, have an estimate of R star on the New York Fed's website. They say it's plus 137 basis points. That's 1.37%. Holy cow, that's a lot higher. Uh, so we'll look at a picture that has that number in it, but that's not gonna change our conclusions, okay? So that's a, the that's a punchline on that. What about the inflation gap? How far are we from where we wanna be? Well, <clears throat> the FOMC has a target. They say 2% inflation, but that's not the end of the story. The story has to be, well, how do you measure inflation? Which inflation measure do you use? Do you use uh, inflation measured from 12 uh, months ago? Uh, do you draw some kind of trend line through the inflation? What do you do? Um, the actual target is in terms of the headline inflation rate. So those are the prices you actually pay and I actually pay. That includes the gasoline that you've used to fill your car if you've got, uh, you're still driving the gas guzzler like me. Uh, uh, if you have to pay for electricity to go in your car, that, that number's in there. Um, if you, uh, 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 headline inflation also includes all kinds of food in it. But those things are often thrown out in this kind of discussion because you want sort of a uh, notion of the center of the price change distribution. You want, you want just to understand the general movement in prices and, not, and you want to exclude outliers on, on the high side or on the low side. So there are ways to do this. Um, one way is to do the core uh, personal consumption expenditures inflation rate. That's the favorite of the committee <clears throat> and has been for years. A more modern way to do this and probably a better way to do it is the Dallas Fed's trim mean. So they would look at all the price changes that occurred, cut some of them off here, throw those out, cut some of these off here, throw those out, take the center of the distribution over here. So <clears throat> both these are actually higher than the headline PC inflation rate. The headline PC inflation rate, which you cited, is 2.4%. These are actually higher numbers than that. So uh, you'd be excluding some of the disinflation that occur has occurred. So here's a picture. Um, on the left, this goes back to 2019. So my life is flashing uh, before my eyes here because I was on the committee at this time when the yellow line was right at 2% there, I was on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> then all hell broke loose. And then uh, we got the big inflation. So there are these three different ways. This is very informative, right? There are three different ways to measure it, and they tell you different things about what the inflation rate was. But basically, they tell the same story. They all go up. Uh, they peak out. Uh, the headline peaks out very high, uh, 7%. And then right in 2022 here, in this part of the picture, uh, this is when the, F the Fed got very aggressive about well, saying hey, we're going to bring inflation under control. That's when you got the 75 basis point increases in the policy rate. That's when Jay Powell went to Jackson Hole and he gave an eight minute speech, which only said we're going to get inflation under control. And then he quit talking. So uh, it, uh, a really good performance on his part because a lot of monetary policy is about the credibility. It's, you know, we're not talking money here, but it's like, how much money are you guys gonna print in the next year? That's really the story. And markets are wondering, I wonder how much this guy's gonna print. And he's saying, I'm not printing any money. We're gonna get inflation under control. So um, that was all going on in 2022. And lo and behold, look what happens. Uh, as soon as we got serious 
uh, inflation starts to come down in 2022 and into 2023, and especially right in here uh, on core inflation right in here. And now we've got numbers, you know, right around 3% or a little bit under 3% on the Fed's favorite measure. Holy cow, what a successful policy. There wasn't any recession. And the immaculate disinflation, that's what markets started calling it, immaculate disinflation. Okay, the other thing we need in the Taylor Rule is this parameter that's going to describe the aggressiveness with which you're supposed to respond to deviations of inflation from target. Um, they, you know, the literature is going to say, well, if inflation is above target, then, then interest rates should be moved up. But how much? Um, and there's a, uh, a heavily studied answer to this question, which is the Taylor principle. That means you should move the policy rate more than one for one with the deviation of inflation from target. So if inflation, you have a target is 2%, 2% inflation, and inflation goes to 3%, you've got a 1% gap there, then your policy rate should go up more than that 100 basis points there. You should go up more than that. That's what this says. So um, that means your parameter value is going to have to be bigger than 1. Uh, the literature's value is 1.5, so I'll use that. And then we'll do a, a softer one, 1.25, for the more generous rule. And then that'll help us get these bounds, the high and low bound, uh, where the policy rate should be. And finally, we have to get the, uh, this output gap, sort of the deviation from the normal level of output. Um, the current value of output is actually above potential. And if you understood the min-max operators in that formula, you would know that uh, if output's above potential, then we're going to zero it out totally. So we're not going to pay any attention to the output gap at this point. Here's two calculations of where the output gap is. This goes back to 2019 as well. You had the pandemic come. Shocking amount of people couldn't work during the pandemic, uh, and they had to stay at home. Output tumbles like crazy, so you get a big negative uh, output gap. But all pretty much comes back in the year following. <coughs> pretty close to a V-shaped recovery. A lot of people didn't think there would be a V-shaped recovery, but that's what happened. And now you're over here on the right-hand part of this chart, and this uh, output gap is positive, but not very big. So uh, we'll, let's just keep that in mind. So what the rule is going to do is just pay, pay no attention to the output gap. We're going to zero that out. So put it all together. We'll get this generous Taylor rule, um, which uses the Dallas Fed trim mean, has the real interest rate of minus 50 basis points, exceptionally low value. And it has a parameter of 1.25, the, the kind of dovish value or the more softer value uh, for that. And for the, um, the more hawkish Taylor rule, we'll put uh, PCE inflation in, which is uh, a little bit different measure of inflation. And the committee's favorite, by the way, um, higher value for R star plus 50 basis points. And the parameter uh, will be 1.5. So you get this picture, which we've already talked about. So the, again, I mean, uh, the point is that uh, that this, this guy here is five and three eighths. These guys want to be between three and four, so you're, you're too high by uh, a lot. Now, if you follow monetary policy on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know that the committee only likes to move at 25 basis points per meeting. So, wait, let's, let's see if we can do the calculation. I'm getting a headache. Uh, 25 basis points, uh, okay, so you do one move and then you come down to like 525, and you do another move, you come down to 5.0, another move, you come down to 4.75. This could take a heck of a long time to get down to the right level here. Uh, so that's why I'm saying this looks pretty high, and uh, these guys, now you'd still be between 3 and 4% here, and uh, that would still be that would still be quite a bit higher than you were uh, pre-pandemic. But the point is, the amount of inflation that you have today is only around 3%. So yes, you want to get rid of that inflation. Yes, you want to put downward pressure and move inflation back to target. 
but you don't have to be way up at this high level of the policy rate in order to do that. Another th way to look at this, um, since some of you might be visual learners, uh, if you think this was the appropriate policy rate last summer, that's what this is saying. This is the appropriate policy rate in the middle of 2023, but inflation was 200 basis points higher in the middle of 2023. So now it's come down. So the, the spirit of the policy rule is that you're reacting to events in the economy in order to set policy. I don't know if any of you guys are from engineering, but this should sound like optimal control to you. If, you do, if any of you guys do this, I don't know if you do it, but uh, that's what it means. You're trying to control some system. <clears throat> you take feedback from the system, then you adjust your control parameter, which here is interest rate, and you do this all the time. So you're moving your control around uh, all the time. A lot like steering a car, you're going down the freeway, your steering car, you're adjusting all the time. Uh, you should be doing the same thing with interest rates. But this looks like, uh, n wait a minute, the data said you're supposed to come down, but the committee didn't come down. They've got their own reasons why they didn't want to come down, and we can talk about those, and we are going to talk about them in some related issues here in just a minute. So I think there are three things uh, that are being argued in financial markets, and I'm going to give you Jim's version of these things. Some people would look at this picture and say, well, I think our star is higher than what you've got uh, on either one of the rules. So the zone that you're talking about should be higher because the R star is higher. That's one thing people are saying. And kind of related to that, the most recent data on the economy has said that the economy has picked up. It's growing faster. So maybe that output gap thing shouldn't be zeroed out. Maybe that's going to cause inflation uh, going forward. And finally, um, it could be that inflation, sure, inflation's come down, but maybe it'll come back uh, in the next couple of months here, and uh, we'll be glad that we kept the interest rate uh, where we did. So I'm going to talk all three of these. All three of these would are arguments that would push in the direction of a higher recommended policy rate. <coughs> so... For the R star thing, um, I said uh, something between minus 50 basis points and plus 50. Uh, but wait a minute, we, we uh, oh, there's good reason to talk about these numbers. Uh, the committee's, um, uh, the pre-pandemic policy rate was about right using these values, so that's one thing. Another thing is that the committee has its uh, so-called dot plot of long-run projections and according to that, they think the neutral policy rate is about two and a half. That would be 200 basis points of inflation and only 50 basis points of real interest rate. So this is kind of, this minus 50 to plus 50 is arguably consistent with what the FOMC thinks. But what about Halston, Lavick, Williams? They say it's 137 basis points. So if you use that value, you would shift up this uh, top line in the zone chart by 87 basis points. But it doesn't change the conclusion. So this picture uh, says, uh, OK, at least for 2023, uh, let's look at this higher value here. And uh, sure, you'd be not as far above the uh, upper bound, but you'd still be above. So you get the same sort of flavor. And if you did this for the whole thing, um, then you'd miss on the pre-pandemic. Uh, you'd, you'd have the pre-pandemic. Uh, zone uh, up here. Okay. Um, what about faster growth in the U.S.? Um, so the idea behind the faster growth would be maybe you shouldn't zero that out. The positive output gap could call for a higher po policy rate. That's true, but if you look at the output gap chart that I showed earlier, the size of that output gap is not that big. If you multiply that further by a smaller parameter, uh, you wouldn't get much action out of that. So I don't think that this is the right argument either. I think that this is a rather small number. And I think this is probably the biggest issue is that inflation came down a lot in the second half of 2023, but we can't quite believe our luck. That's the attitude of a lot of uh, commentators on uh, monetary policy. So it could be that inflation, even though it looks like it came down, maybe it'll turn around 
and maybe it will. It's a stochastic process, so that's possible. But it would take quite a bit of upward movement in inflation to rationalize the current level of the policy rate. You'd have to turn around and go up 200 basis points uh, on a core measure that is already smoothed out, that th those things don't move that fast, usually. And even if it did happen, uh, then you could respond to that, which would be in the spirit of the Taylor Rule, to say, well, if um, things are going in the wrong direction, then you have to react to that and move the policy rate accordingly. So, um, so the, the spirit of the, the rule is to say things are happening in the economy that are telling me to change the policy rate. You should react. Uh, if inflation comes down, then you're supposed to move the policy rate down. If inflation goes back up, well, well too bad. I'm going to have to move the policy rate back up, and that's the way uh, this would work. So it would be the responsibility of the committee to react to inflation developments in a timely manner, either higher or lower. All right. You're saying, thank God he's reached this slide. <laughs> thank God. So I've only got 20 pages of conclusions here. So uh, <clears throat> no, I'm kidding. Um, so this really is a summary of what I said. So uh, global financial markets, and by, you know, I don't know if everyone in this room really understands, but this, you know, you're pricing tens of trillions of dollars of assets around the world in real time every day. So it's a big thing. Got tons of information coming in at you all the time. So that's why it's, uh, you have uh, news networks like Bloomberg or CNBC, and they've been arguing about next moves for US monetary policy, and they've been expecting a lower policy rate soon. So I'm aligning with those that, that are saying, well, why isn't the policy rate lower? Um, this picture, this main picture, has one idea about how to think about this issue. Like I said, I like to do it this way because it centers the debate. You can look at the picture and you can say, well, I don't like this aspect, I don't like that aspect, I, you know, or, or some other reason why you think the policy rate should be higher. Uh, looks like the current value of the policy rate is uh, significantly elevated relative to recommendations from the Taylor rules used here. Still true, even if you make additional adjustments. Um, so that explains why global financial markets expect lower levels of the policy rate soon. According to markets uh, today, uh, they've got the probability of a rate cut at the June meeting, still a little ways away. Uh, it's about 50-50 uh, this morning, I think. So, um, uh, so it looks like um, markets are expecting uh, something to happen but this picture would say a lot has to happen to get to the right level of the policy rate. So I'll stop there and I'll see if this has triggered any questions in your mind, or I'm willing to talk about many other topics under the sun if you want to. Uh, and uh, I thank you for having me here and I'm uh, looking forward to your questions. So thanks very much. <laughs> Okay, hey, thank you very much, Jim. Um, we're prepared to take some Q&A, and there are gonna be some microphones. So if you'd like to ask Jim a question, raise your hand, and uh, we'll bring a microphone to you. Should have got Scott there sir, to start off. Thank you. The Taylor rules that you spent all the time on, which seems to make a lot of sense and such, what weighting does the committee have using this methodology versus other calculations and such? Uh, the committee has said, uh, and I think most members have said on various occasions, that the Taylor rules are a good input into the process, but the judgments have to be made. And even in this discussion, that's exactly what we did. You have to say, you have to come down on, well, where do you think our star really is? And, and uh, how big is the inflation gap? And how do you want to measure inflation? All these kinds of issues. So I don't think you can be, um, uh, you know, you want to turn it over to the computer uh, to make monetary policy, but they're good input and it help, does help center the debate because it makes people face up to the magnitudes involved and get serious about, if, if they think this is a wrong recommendation, that's perfectly fine, but they, you know, it forces people to come up with an argument about why this is wrong. Yeah. Oh, okay, Alan, why don't you take it? <laughs> Dr. Bullard, thank you very much for your talk. <laughs> Uh, my name is Alan. I'm a recent accounting graduate of the 
Miami Herbert Business School. Uh, I, I have a few questions for you. I read a lot in the Wall Street Journal, other publications, Brookings, and I remember a talk that was given by Chris Waller, who I'm sure you know, and in his talk, Chris Waller first talked about current economic conditions at that point in time, which would justify a lowering of the federal target interest rate. But then he qualifies his talk by saying, but maybe not, maybe not. Maybe there are additional conditions that may occur that we're not familiar with that will cause us to keep the rate elevated. And as of today, it's still elevated. And I was reading an article uh, that quoted you as saying, Bullard says February job report increases chance of Fed cutting interest rates uh, sooner. And this was March 8th, and this is almost April 8th now. Could you explain why theory doesn't really support what's happening in actuality? So, uh, I mean, uh, Data is rolling in all the time, and it's very subtle, uh, and you have to follow it closely because markets have an ex for a jobs report, for instance. Markets will have an expectation; they'll say, "Oh, I expect you know 180,000 jobs to have been created in the last month." Then you get the actual print; maybe it says 250,000 jobs. So now they have to reprice because the actual number didn't come in the way they expected. But you could have the same number come in, perplexingly. You could, they could have expected 300,000 jobs to be created, and then the actual number came in at 250. Now they have to reprice in the opposite direction because the expectation was wrong in the opposite direction. So a great deal depends on uh, market-based expectations of what they think is going to happen uh, on a lot of these reports. A lot of it is hair-splitting, subtleties, but I would warn you not to disregard it just because of that. There's trillions of dollars out there that, and of worth of assets that have to be priced. And when situation changes a little bit, that's a lot of money on the table. So this is why this goes on this way in kind of a ridiculous fashion. And you see, you see all these tidbits of data coming in, and this is pushing the market around one, one way or another. Uh, but that data is coming in relative to expectations. So um, that report, I thought, was a little bit soft compared to what markets had expected. That's why I say that it. Um, uh, I said there that uh, that probably increases the probability a little bit that there would be a cut uh, in the policy rate. Yeah, Too long of an answer. Just, just hold on. Right here, we have a in the, in the Miami and um, Boston Red Sox cap. No, no, he cannot speak. <laughs> um, good evening, Mr. Bullard. Um, I have a question regarding since you joined the Fed in um, 2008, the Fed did quantitative easing for I think a 14-year period, and you had an unprecedented um, uh, situation in COVID in which the Fed got involved and began expanding the money supply uh, to the point where I think 80% of all US dollars in existence were printed over the course of two, three years. Um, you, the Fed also uh, purchased government uh, and uh, corporate bonds in 2020 as an extraordinary measure for the first time in history. Um, by adopting a zero rate uh, policy, um, you had QE infinity, essentially, and you had a quite expansionary monetary policy like never before. So um, where I'm going with this is, do you think that there was reluctancy amongst the other FOMC members to raise rates to a sufficiently restrictive level? Um, they were saying, oh, it's transitory, it'll come down. Um, I think you and uh, Loretta Mester were some of the most hawkish members on the FOMC for a while. Um, I would recall when you would go on CNBC and give your remarks on a more hawkish point of view, I would get notification, Bullard says this, market was down a few hundred points. Um, do you think there was Sorry, a... Sorry, man. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, exactly. So do, do you think that there was reluctancy because of these unprecedented measures and nobody at the Fed really knew, despite having you know 300 economists or 400 and, that have all these predictions, <clears throat> nobody knew what the outcome would be 
um, yeah. because you just injected trillions of dollars into the system that maybe went above what was necessary? Yeah. So I mean, I'll give you uh, uh, where I think the source of inflation was for this, uh, this time around. So all those years between 2009 and 2019, we really have any inflation to speak of. And if anything, inflation came in below the target, the 2% target. So we're doing all these things, uh, not just in the US, but globally, uh, to try to get inflation to be at the 2% target. Um, obviously, that after the pandemic, then that all went out the window. Why? I think, um, <clears throat> so I've spoken in other venues about this. I'll give you the, uh, the, the condensed version here. You should think of the pandemic as a war. Uh, it wasn't a hot war, but it's, it's a social upheaval. And when there's social upheaval, what happens? The government starts spending a lot of money without asking too many questions about where the future taxes are gonna come from. So you get deficit spending. And this was deficit spending on a grand scale, on the scale of a third of GDP. And uh, the other thing uh, is that they asked the central bank to keep interest rates low to support the war effort. So this is the, this is the formula across History, economic history, all kinds of different times and places, different institutions, different people, different situations, but that formula almost always generates inflation. So when you look at the uh, global pandemic as a war and you look at what the US reaction was, heavy deficit spending, keep interest rates low, well, yeah, it's gonna generate inflation and that's exactly what happened. Um, and especially, I think the initial response in March, April of 2020 might have been calibrated uh, about right for the scale of the disaster that we had. But then you had extra uh, uh, fiscal deficits in December, uh, a big bill in December of 2020, uh, because both parties were worried about the Georgia election. And then another big bill when the Democrats came to power in March of 2021. So these two last bills were uh, actually at a point where the, rece uh, the recession was ending and the, uh, the pandemic looked like it was going to come to a close because you had uh, vaccines coming in in the spring of 2021. So all this is to say is that this went too far and, uh, and then we kept interest rates low in uh, as well. So you got a lot of inflation out of that. How do you get rid of the inflation? You have to go back to orthodoxy, back to the pre-pandemic policy. So you have to quit the deficit spending. The US did that, not really by design, but because you have divided government. And once you have divided government, they aren't gonna agree on uh, big spending bills anymore. So that happened. Uh, in uh, uh, the 2022 elections. And then in addition, the central bank has to get serious about uh, keeping inflation under control. You raise the policy rate a lot, all the way, 500 basis points, all the way up above 5%, uh, which was very high for this era. Lo and behold, both those things happen. Boom, inflation came back down. So that's my story about what happened uh, in this particular episode. So thank you. He was having a bunk of, but anybody at the back as well, raise your hand. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, great presentation. I'm an engineer. So oh, wow. excellent. I'm not an economist. Tell me so, if the optical control now, is right. You know, I, I, I would like to ask you about, you know, the statement about that the interest rates, current interest rates are restrictive. Yeah. Now, the economy is doing really well. Yes. Recently was revised, 3.2%. Yeah. So the economy is doing great. Unemployment is at the lowest level. Uh, the stock market are the peaks. Uh, speculative assets like Bitcoin going to the roof, right? So if this is speculative, right, what will happen the moment that interest rates go down with this economy doing great speculation going up, stock yeah. market? Are we risking if you lower the interest rates uh, to trigger a massive bubble across the board? Yeah. So uh, this is a good point. So uh, for those of you that follow the economy closely, and I said in the talk, uh, the recent data has been pretty strong. 
uh, on the U.S. economy. Labor market looks good, uh, very good even. Um, still, uh, uh, economic growth was quite strong in the second half of 2023. Even today, looking pretty good uh, for the first quarter of 2024. Uh, so many things are, are looking good. So uh, we didn't get into it here in this talk, but um, one of the things that happened was at the December meeting, this is so fun, isn't it? So fun. So uh, at the December meeting, uh, it came off dovish. Uh, so markets got the idea that, okay, the Fed's going to cut uh, rates very soon. So market rates actually went down in anticipation uh, that the Fed was going to do something. So as a policymaker, you're kind of flummoxed uh, at that point because the markets have gotten ahead of what you're actually doing. Uh, and maybe that's not such a good thing uh, if you felt like you needed to stay restrictive uh, for longer. So the two-year came down, two-year especially, Treasury came down substantially um, in reaction. Now, some of that's been bid back, uh, bid back, so it's a little bit different now. But um, So that's a major issue, which I don't have time to get into here, but there is definitely a factor, is that um, markets are anticipating what the Fed will do. Therefore, they're pricing it in way ahead of time before the Fed actually does uh, anything. And then you might get effects from that way ahead of where you want them. But still, if it's a risk of a major bubble, even further, that looking about the labor market. OK, the other thing I would say, it is a risk. The other thing I would say about this is um, a lot of the um, thinking behind the, uh, the 2022 policy was a comparison to the 1990s. Uh, and uh, there's a famous episode in the second half of the 1990s. Uh, the policy rate in 1994 was raised a lot, kind of like this time, and uh, inflation came to target, and the policy rate was adjusted only a little bit after that, and the economy absolutely boomed in the second half of the 1990s. So, uh, it'd be, so that's a kind of template for what we hope will happen here you got inflation to target, and now the economy is perfectly capable of uh, booming uh, for years to come. That's what happened in the 90s. And people said there was a bubble, and the bubble eventually burst. Oh, all right. <laughs> the dot-com right. bubble eventually burst, yeah. There was a bubble. There's a question right here. We'll, we'll share the... Uh... <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Brandon Shmilovich. I feel like your presentation has been fantastic. My question to you is, if you compare during this period, let's say in 2021, the inflation in Argentina, and you compare the inflation, let's say in America, you say that the pandemic had a massive effect on the inflation in America. Why wasn't the inflation in America as bad as the inflation in Argentina taking a country like that? Yes, a great, a great question. So um, there's a league of countries around the world uh, that are inflation targeting countries. This means they set an inflation target and they take actions to achieve that inflation target. And uh, it means orthodoxy about you raise interest rates when inflation is too high, you follow the Taylor principle, you don't have too big of deficit spending, all these things come into the mix. It's been fantastically successful since it was introduced in the 1990s. Inflation around the world came closer, much closer to the inflation targets uh, uh, expected inflation was closer to the inflation target. So it's been uh, really successful uh, all through the 90s, 2000s, and even, even during the, uh, between, after the global financial crisis and up through the pandemic. However, there are countries that have bucked this. They have said, well, we don't believe in any of that. We've got our own ideas about how you control inflation. We've got our own ideas about how we should run monetary policy perfectly fine. If they're sovereign nations, they could do what they want. Argentina is one example. Venezuela is another example. Turkey is another example. These are countries that have said, we don't believe in the inflation targeting orthodoxy. They end up with 60% inflation, 100% inflation, 150% inflation. So they've had, uh, in, in the eyes of the rest of the world, they do everything wrong politically uh, or from a policy point of view. And that's why they haven't that's why I haven't succeeded. Well, we have a deficit Ricardo spending, especially. Ricardo yeah. Lago here is uh, an expert in South America. Let's take it away. Uh, my question is on the viability of the 
soft landing or the continuation of the soft landing. And I'm going to frame it in the 1970 paper of your predecessor in the Fed of uh, San Luis, uh, William Poole, yes. that uh, very nice article on the ISLM. So you take the policy rate, the federal funds rate, as your instrument for monetary policy, and you raise it as high as, high as necessary to win the fight against inflation, to have inflation on the down. Uh, now, you reduce the budget deficit from the extraordinary pandemic levels, but then you have in 2023, you have still a slash fund of uh, delayed funds from the pandemic is still there, and you run a budget deficit of over $2 trillion. So, in, in Pulse uh, framework, Okay, the, the IS would have told you that you will have a recession, but you're shifting the IS and you have a nice soft landing. Now, my question is, is it viable to have this kind of budget deficit? Is it politically feasible? Is it uh, economically or financially desirable? And if it is not, what's going to happen after? Yeah, uh, the U.S. is unfortunately, um, we're not doing as much as we did during the pandemic and the immediate aftermath of the pandemic. We're still running very large deficits, and um, uh, it's not a good situation. I think our politicians have given up on the idea that they can win an election by being tough on uh, fiscal spending. Um, there are only a few members of Congress that even will talk about this issue, and they're considered outliers uh, in the Congress. So uh, I think our only hope is divided government. <laughs> so when there's divided government, then they won't agree on uh, what to spend. Um, so the other thing about government spending is, you know, what are they spending it on? Uh, and to their credit, there is an infrastructure bill was passed uh, uh, I'm going to get the date wrong. I guess it was 2022. And um, that money is still uh, pouring out. Uh, and that's a lot of projects. A lot of these big construction projects and stuff, they take a long time. That's why you see these cranes around and freeways being rebuilt and stuff like that. But uh, at least in principle, um, that could be good stuff. Uh, that's improving public capital. And that should be complementary to uh, uh, to productivity in the private sector, and that should be good for, for output. So that part of the spending, I think you wouldn't worry about so much is when, uh, it's when the spending is going to less productive uses uh, that, that you'd be more worried. So, but um, uh, the U.S. longer term or me even medium term fiscal situation does not look good, and uh, we'd like Congress to get serious about it, but they think they can't win elections on that issue, I think. Jillian. Uh, thanks, Professor Bullard. I uh, appreciate your presentation. Um, yeah. Uh, nice work distilling complicated concepts into a much simpler form. Appreciate that. Uh, my question to you is, um, you talked about where inflation has realized, I guess, probably an annualized metric. Um, did you or did your committee members ever consider inflation expectations? Um, as you see now, like oil and copper prices going up, does that impact uh, the way you might look at the output of this formula or even adapt the formula? Yeah, so um, I'm one of the champions on the committee at citing especially market-based uh, uh, expectations of inflation. Um, I like them because you have this daily feel to them and they're bouncing around uh, in reaction to the latest data. And unfortunately, they're pointing up uh, actually right now. So one year and two year inflation expectations have moved up. Uh, that does not bode well. Uh, I would take that as a negative sign, but it's not definitive. And uh, we've also got um, survey-based evidence. So you could look at the survey-based evidence. I haven't been as much of a fan of that as that uh, of that, but um, but that's another place to look. So. Inflation expectations are kind of the whole story, so yeah, you do have to look at them. Thank you very much. Jim, I know we have a lot more questions for you. We can perhaps get a chance to speak with you there, but I want to thank you for that okay. wonderful talk.